Hi, Jesse. How are you doing? Good. How about you? I can hear you really well. You must be on a different computer. No, a different, same machine as always. I don't know. Maybe you're closer to your microphone than usual. Okay. I only have the one that will do Zoom. Yeah. A lot of um, times it's hard to hear you, but this time it's great. You said that. Um, can't imagine anything's changed, but I'm glad it works. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, do we have a treasurer's report for this month? Uh, nothing since what uh, she gave us at the meeting. Oh, gee. You know, that's not really a treasurer's report. That's just a kind of a record of the checks and re revenues and stuff. Um, I feel like we need to tell the members something. I can grab my sheet from that. It at least gives a balance, right? I think. What do you think? Yeah. I'd... Because yeah. then are we um, are we also going to talk about the projects um, that Audrey's hoping to develop? We are. Uh, I have in the presentation mention of lots of things that we're hoping to move forward with. Yeah, I think that's good because I'm sure that most members don't even realize what Wild Ones can do in terms of partnerships. And if they hear things that we're working on, somebody else might say, oh, my HOA this or my township that, and maybe it'll develop into something different. Right. And if they know that we have X hundred dollars that we need to spend on that work, hopefully, I don't think anybody has any idea, you know, like Girl Scouts, they don't really know where their money goes, right? So when that part comes up, anything that I forget, um, just mention it. Because okay, I think the only things Audrey's working on, it's um, East Pikeland, right? So when I share my screen, I see a limited, hi Michelle, amount of uh, people's name. And good, I'm seeing Dan, hi Dan. And no, I don't see it in either. There's got to be some other way to do this. To do what? Like you said, to see the participants. But you're right, this, it doesn't show on the screen. Only the person talking shows. Right. There's, there's, um, if you go to where you can see the people who are talking, there's, Four different. This is Judy. Hi, I'm muted most of the time in my video because I'm eating dinner. You should see a little tiny line, then a slightly bigger box, then two boxes, and then a square. And if you want to see more people, you can click on the square that looks like a square of nine, and then you'll see the participants differently. Or if you just want to see who's here, down at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll down below Jesse's slide, you should see something that says participants 14, and if you click on that that will show you a list of everyone who's on the call. Yeah, I can see that, but I can't get, you know how sometimes there's a um, band, a vertical band or a horizontal band with all the participants, I can't get that. That has to do with how you have your bar displayed up at the top. And you're, I think it's under view options. Oh, um, I see view. Where is it? Judy, with the way that I have my box, is that hindering anybody's view of my screen sharing? No, because we don't see how you have your box. Right now I have it down, so I'm only seeing the person who's talking or the presenter. Okay. So I've made you a small box and I can move you up out of the way of the slides. I'd love to be out of the way. That works, Judy, <laughs> thank you. Oh, good. Okay, I am almost ready to start here. I'm going to give everybody a couple more minutes to file in. Um, I'm seeing some new and familiar names scrolling in here. That's very good. Okay. How's everybody doing with planting their plants that they got uh, from North Creek? The lots to plant. George and I have gotten everything in the ground. And in addition, we moved, a, a, he moved a, a bayberry tree over to the new garden that we're putting in. We also planted everything that we got from 
um, Redbud and from Edge of the Woods and something I got online from I forget who. And then we just had an order show up from Fairy Nursery today with Michelle. The last 20 items that go in the side of the woods garden, the mist flower, and then we're going to put up the deer fence. Woo! Uh, I'm telling so you, busy. those two win the award for Judy. You've got to show the pictures of all the plants you guys put in. It's crazy. I want pictures. Yeah, I, I will. Send, I know Susan wants pictures, right? I will send them to you. I promise. George is going to take a video of of the whole thing now that everything's in there because we all added the yeah. He finished the other end today. He plant well. He planted twelve milkweeds today. Moved the bayberry. And plant, um, and then finish mulching it. So it was well, fabulous. He if worked. you would do us the kindness of a before and after, we'll even take your video and we could share it at a meeting um, because it is inspiring and exciting to see all that you're doing. So we would do that. I, I, I cannot wait for. Oh, then and then there were also the 64 things we planted out front. No, 78 things we planted out front. So yeah, well, we'll, we'll take some wonderful. pictures. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, guys, I am uh, going to get us on a roll here. Uh, thank you for coming to our October chapter meeting. We have had at least seven new members since our last meeting. And as of earlier today, our current membership total is 74. That's amazing. For any of you who are not familiar, we chartered in January. Um, and to charter, we needed 10 members. And since then, we have grown to 74. So that's amazing. Um, we had done a lot of um, tabling events last month. And I think that that helped us meet a lot of people and um, get some new members. So that's very exciting. Uh, for those of you who have not been to a meeting before, I just wanna go over uh, who we all are. I'm Jesse, I'm the president of our chapter. Audrey is on with us. She's our vice president and she, um, makes our thought of the month happen. We'll be having that in just a little bit. Um, Susan is on with us and she is our secretary and webmaster. I've added our email addresses to this slide to try and help people um, contact us if they need to a little bit easier. Michelle's our treasurer. Um, she's on with us and she's gonna talk with us about some uh, great projects that have been happening and where we are financially, which is Really, we're in a great financial spot for just starting the chapter. No pressure there. Lindy is with us. She's our membership chair. She reaches out to those interested and uh, those who have decided to become members and welcomes them with uh, information and an email. And um, she's also spreading the word in her college classes about wild ones. So she's helping to inspire our next generation of kids that can save the world. And Marilyn, I didn't see her name on tonight, but she is our advisor in all things Native. So um, I hope she gets to join us tonight. There are several ways to get to our information. I wanna tell you, I was very excited to send out our meeting invitation to over 290 emails um, and several people replied back that they were not able to make the meeting, but they, was it recorded? Will they receive a link? And I assure you it is being recorded and you will get the link after the meeting. And so those people will get to see all of the great things we're talking about and going to learn about tonight. And anybody who would like to can see the previous meeting recordings on our YouTube channel. We also have, uh, what is this, Instagram. Uh, Lindy runs that. I know, I barely know what it's called. I do not have anything to do with it. And we have an amazing Facebook page that has lots of information. And we have our own website that has lots of our resources and uh, links to meeting 
uh, summaries that Susan does for us, thankfully. A shout out to all of the new areas and the new people that have joined us. We cover such a vast area. Um, because we are the first chapter of Wild Ones in Pennsylvania, we are covering all of southeastern Pennsylvania. But as you can see, we also reach into Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. We have members. So it's very exciting to be able to reach all of these people because we are all in the same eco region. We're all growing the same plants, uh, or we should be. And um, so plants don't know these political boundaries that we call states. So it's great that we have members to learn about the plants that belong there, uh, not just in PA. The problem with covering such a large area is that Zoom is very convenient to get us all together. Uh, in the future, we do want to have more in-person meetings, but I, under I understand everybody's going to have to kind of pick and choose their availability and their comfort level with driving the distance that might be. But rest assured, we will probably hold events in your area at some point. We've already, as a chapter, traveled to New Jersey for a field trip. So those New Jersey uh, members, you know, we're coming your way too. So we do hope to make it around. At this time, we would like to have our thought of the month and we are lucky enough to have both Audrey and Shannon working on our thought of the month. So I am going to turn it over to them and I'm gonna mute myself for a moment. Shannon, Hi, can everyone hear you? me? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, so I'm Shannon and I've been a uh, Wild Ones member for a while, been coming to the meetings since December. And I'm um, just going to uh, read the thought of the month by Audrey. And then I'll be talking a little bit more about leaving the leaves and other ways that you can um, be ecologically friendly this fall. So uh, Audrey's thought of the month. We are looking forward to the leaves turning and seeing all their beautiful colors. Soon after come the rakes and the blowers and the bags, so much noise and so much work, ugh. But it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, we should leave the leaves. And here are some reasons why. Butterflies and moths overwinter in the leaf layers, some as eggs, some as caterpillars, chrysalises or adults. See if you can find luna moth or swallowtail cocoons and chrysalises camouflaged as dried leaves. Leaves also offer protection from the coming cold, snow, and ice for butterflies and moths, as well as spiders, bees, snails, worms, beetles, and more. In turn, these provide food for animals like chipmunks, turtles, and birds. Please leave your leaves whole instead of mowing or shredding. This ensures that no critters are chopped up in the process. If you want to remove the leaves from your lawn, consider placing them in a pile somewhere in your yard where they can remain undisturbed. You can even build a simple bin to contain them. Many lumber yards and distributors offer free pallets if you will pick them up. Another simple leaf bin can be made from wire fencing and metal fence posts. My neighbor said she had a beautiful leaf compost after only one year sitting in her leaf bin. Leaves are also nature's mulch. It's beautiful and it's free. Try mulching your garden beds with your leaves instead of using wood mulch. You will retain moisture, suppress weeds, and add nutrients to the soil as the leaves decay. And even a thick layer of leaves is lighter than most wood mulch, so young perennials will have an easier time emerging in the spring. Please share this information with your friends and neighbors and consider posting some of the great photos and captions for Leave the Leaves from, or hashtag Leave the Leaves from Xerxes Society. And um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about some more of these images I have that I um, 
we got from uh, the one on the left is from Pollinary, Pollinator Friendly Yards on Facebook. Um, so like Audrey was saying, uh, see if you can find the Luna moth overwintering in this leaf. The arrow is pointing to the tough cocoon of silk that's barely visible to our eyes. Um, many insects form their pupa and cocoons in the camouflage folds of the leaves and some species like the red banded hair streak even lay their eggs in leaf litter where the caterpillars emerge in the spring. They feed off the leaf litter before becoming the next generation of red banded hair streaks. Uh, firefly larvae also thrive in leaf litter. They eat destructive garden slugs. So um, just imagine how beneficial that would be to your garden if you left the leaves there. Why would you shred, chop, burn, or blow away or throw away leaves in a yard waste bin to be carted off your property? You're literally killing and throwing away next year's insects. Allow these insects to overwinter in your yard by gently raking the leaves into wild areas, under trees, or into garden beds. You can allow the leaves to decompose naturally. Many of the insects will not emerge till nighttime temperatures are steadily 50 degrees, according to the Xerxes Society, which means for us after Mother's Day. There are also numerous benefits to keeping your leaves on your property. Leaves are the perfect protection for the soil community. They encourage root growth, aid carbon sequestration, and feed the mycorrhizal fungal networks in moist, fertile soil. Leaves also prevent the germination of weed seeds, so they really are the perfect mulch. Um, and next, I have an example of leaves uh, and branches placed in a brush pile. There are a lot of birds and small mammals that forage through the leaves to find food in the winter. And by creating a brush pile in an undisturbed area of your yard, you can provide birds and other small mammals with safety from predators and cover from the harsh weather. You can also help provide these basic needs by incorporating plenty of native trees and shrubs in your land landscaping, of course. Um, and there on the right is a goldfinch um, eating some kind of dried plant seeds. And this is important because the seed stock of your dried plants is nature's bird feeder. So, even if you already have bird feeders outside, consider leaving your seed heads standing throughout the winter to give overwintering birds extra support. Wait to trim back this year's woody stems and perennials until early March after the birds have had their fill. If there's a branch in danger of falling, of course you can prune that, make your judgments based on safety. Um, but you know, if you do need to prune anything, you can gently place the debris in your brush pile. Uh, and speaking of pruning um, your plants, if you have plant stems from last year that were cut, you can take a look. As the weather gets colder, you might notice a native bee or some other insect living in there. Um, Jess, you could go to the next slide. And Let's see, one more. Yeah, that, that one um, on the right there. Um, so there's a little, some kind of little bee that lives in there. Um, we have in the United States, 4,000 species of native bees and 70% of them nest in the ground, but 30% live in, um, they actually ex excavate the woody stems of plants to make their nest. Um, and there are some plants that are easily excavated, which are mentioned in a um, interview with Doug Tallamy um, on Margaret Roach's, uh, I think it's a podcast, but it's also a blog that she has called A Way to Garden. Um, he said it's elderberry, goldenrod, evening primrose, and other meadow plants are the type of plants that bees can excavate. According to Heather Holm, they nest in, the bees nest in meadow plants within the first two feet from the ground. And they do this in last year's stems. So the takeaway is 
when you do cut your perennials back in the spring, cut only two feet from the ground. And then because the bees excavate old wood, they'll live in last year's stems near the ground the following winter. So the plants that you prune this coming spring will um, provide homes for the bees next winter. Um, so it's my uh, first winter gardening ecologically, but I've never really uh, had to prune anything or, or done leave the leaves before, but I was wondering if anyone had any examples of plant species in their yards that they've noticed native bees overwintering in or um, any bent, like any personal testament of leaving the leaves that they might want to share. I don't know if we have time for a share, but if they want to share it in the chat, that would be fine too. We definitely have time. If anybody has some experience, I can add, I've definitely seen um, overwintering insects use my elderberry canes and old raspberry canes. Uh, also goldenrod stems for sure. And I keep looking, if you notice, if you keep pokeberry uh, or pokeweed, the huge trunky like stems of those have all of these neat little channels and things in it. I've never actually caught anything or, or seen anything, but I feel like they look like they could be little condominiums. So I'm going to keep checking it out. I'm sure something lives in there. Thank you. Yeah, I have some pokeberry and um, now I have goldenrod. So I'm leaving it for the birds, but you know, I guess I'll have to wait a year <laughs> for the bees. That's awesome, Shannon. Thank you. And Audrey, thank you so much for, um, for preparing that for us. Very interesting and also very exciting to look for those signs of life all over the place. Um, next, we are uh, very pleased that Dan Berenger of Natural Lands has offered to give us a presentation tonight on invasive plants, identification and management. Um, Dan is the invasive management coordinator at Natural Lands. Uh, he's the Crow's Nest Preserve Manager. I got to meet Dan when I was taking uh, Force of Nature classes there through Natural Lands. And um, he was teaching us how to identify things like Oriental Bittersweet and the right time to tackle them, to be saving on time and energy and being effective at actually combating the plant. Um, he's been so kind and encouraging to me personally and to the chapter as a whole, getting started. And I think when I look at our roster by date, Dan is at the top of the list. He has been a Wild Ones member uh, for a long time before we were even a chapter. So I am going to stop sharing my screen, Dan, so that you are able to share yours. Uh, let me... Jesse? Yes? Jesse, this is Susan. Before we go into the presentation, did you want to just present a real brief treasures report and project report, or do you want that at the end of the meeting? Well, yeah, we'll do it at the end. Thank you. Okay, okay no problem. Stop sharing there. And okay, Dan, you are good to share. Perfect, I see a, a beautiful picture of natural lands. Great, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, that's a yes? Yes, excellent. Okay, great. Um, Cause you don't get a lot of feedback otherwise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, Jesse didn't mention that she also volunteers in our garden at the visitor center at Crow's Nest Preserve. So we're very thankful for that. It's a native, wildflower garden that surrounds um, an, a barn from the 1900 or 1800s uh, that shows people how they can use native plants in the landscape. Natural Lands has a series of preserves all over eastern Pennsylvania and southern 
New Jersey, about 43 preserves total, many of which are open to the public. And Crow's Nest in Chester County is the one where I work. Uh, one of the things that we find in managing our preserves is that invasive plants are one of the major issues that interferes with our goals for the land. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement statement. Crow's Nest, where I am tonight, is situated in Lenape Hocking, the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Lenape. We pay respect to the Lenape past, present, and future, and to their continuing cultural heritage and connections with this homeland. Land use and the history of land use has a major impact on what is present today. And so this is really critical to uh, how we experience and manage land today. Before we attack invasives, we want to have a positive goal. We need to articulate what are the things that we are managing the land for. Each of our preserves may have different management goals. Here are a, a few pictures of some of our different preserves. Many of them are former farms, rolling farmland um, that are being restored with native plants. Uh, but there may be many different goals and it's important to identify what those are uh, because it's not practical just to say, we're gonna get rid of all invasive species. That's not likely to occur. And, uh, and so we want to articulate what it is about these landscapes that we really appreciate having. There's Cheslin Preserve at dawn. And we have salt marshes in South Jersey, the Fortescue Glades preserves. Some are managed for water quality, such as the Birdsboro Water Authority land outside of Birdsboro, which is under conservation easement. Or a small community places like Saunders Woods Preserve in Bryn Mawr. Each of these preserves has a series of wildflowers that are um, among the species that we're managing for. So I'm gonna show a bunch of pictures of desirable non-invasive species first so that we can appreciate what it is um, that we're trying to protect when we manage invasive species. So one of the earliest of our spring ephemeral wildflowers is bloodroot. Um, and there are many others such as trout lily, quite small flower. These pictures that were taken by a volunteer, Dennis Manchone, are extremely close up pictures. And so these are much smaller flowers than they appear. He's a much better photographer than I am. Trailing arbutus, um, this has a very slight fragrant and it's a very small ground cover that occurs here at Crow's Nest. We have Dutchman's breeches at the preserve. It is growing in a place that also has Japanese honeysuckle and seems to be holding its own against the Japanese honeysuckle. Round lobe tepatica is one of the earliest of our spring wildflowers. And then nodding trillium is one which I'll, I'll, it's our small success story because we have a section of woods that was dominated by garlic mustard, but did not have any nodding trillium. And we undertook an experiment starting about 10 years ago to see what it would take to get rid of the garlic mustard in this area. And it wasn't easy. It took many years and many volunteers sort of burning out over the smell of garlic mustard as they were pulling it. Um, but it's mostly gone now. It's down to a, a, an easy maintenance level. And what has happened in the years since then, nodding trillium has filled in this area. I can't prove causation, only correlation, but it's pretty thrilling to have nodding trillium in this area of woods near the visitor center uh, in, instead of garlic mustard. We also have pink lady slipper orchid in some of our more unique forest habitats, as well as showy orchids that you can see on our deep woods trail. Even things like Solomon seal, which is fairly common but you don't see it in our landscapes that have been overtaken by invasive species. We have a second peak of bloom in midsummer, late summer uh, in our wet, sunny meadows. So things like swamp milkweed or cardinal flower, all naturally occurring native species that you can see at Crow's Nest Preserve. Blue vervain, New York ironweed, many others. Uh, and then a series of fauna that 
uh, also occur on the preserve and have specific requirements that native species can fulfill. So, so things like spotted turtle, American toad, spotted salamander, and various insects such as this damselfly or black and yellow agriote spiders, and even things like flying squirrels. Uh, flying squirrels are very common, although you very rarely see them. This one stuck around for a picture for quite a while in daylight. And opossum, uh, which love to eat ticks. Uh, these are all among the many species uh, that, that are threatened by invasive species. And I guess the point is there's a much greater diversity of native species uh, that are potentially occurring at this place uh, compared to a relatively small number of, of very aggressive invasive species. So most of these uh, invasive species are non-indigenous. They have been introduced from other places either on purpose or by accident. Um, many for ornamental uh, landscaping or also things like erosion control. Uh, and the, one of the problems with them is that they overwhelm the landscape. There's nothing in this photograph that is not garlic mustard. These are the seedlings that come up. So it's fair to say that in that uh, square foot of ground, there will be nothing growing the following season other than garlic mustard. There are um, in, invasive species tend to be adapted to disturbances and some of those are naturally occurring and others um, are ones that humans have made more dramatic. Things like logging creates an opening in the canopy development, also removing trees and adding impervious surfaces. Stream flooding, which can be made worse by impervious surfaces upstream. But it's also true that all trees someday die. And um, when they do, they create a gap in that canopy. And that gap can either be colonized by a diversity of native species undergoing succession in that location, or by a relatively small number of invasive species. Invasive species can even be favored by things like pollution, nitrogen deposition from automobile exhaust um, that, that falls with rain and adds nitrogen to the soil. That chemical disturbance creates the condition under which some invasive species thrive. And when I say artificially high wildlife populations, that's primarily deer that preferentially browse on many of our native species and also can create a disturbance uh, with their hooves and, and um, create bare soil and track weed seed from one place to another. Some of the impacts of these invasive species, uh, one would be nutrient cycle. There are nutrient cycling. There are some species, even if they're not in the pea family that fight, that fix nitrogen from the air and add it to the soil, thereby creating the conditions that would further encourage invasive species. They can alter the hydrology of a site. I'm thinking here particularly of the tamarisk in, uh, in southwestern United States that evapotranspires water at a faster rate than any of the native species that would otherwise occur there. And so it actually dries up the rivers. Um, there is a plant in the Intermountain West um, called cheat grass that changes the fire regime uh, in that area. It burns hotter and more frequently than any of the native species that would otherwise occur there. And it's called cheat grass in part because if you're trying to graze cattle on it, it is cheating you because it offers very little nutrients for, for the cattle. But invasive species can even change the very shape of the land, the geomorphology. And, and by that, uh, you may think initially of dune formation at the seashore, but it also applies to the shape of the stream side, the, um, the, the way stream banks come down either a gentle or steep bank. And I'm thinking there of Japanese knotweed, which is an herbaceous perennial plant that is very invasive along stream corridors, 
but dies back in the winter and leaves bare soil because nothing else was able to compete with it during the growing season. And so that leaves stream banks bare and prone to erosion. And then that in fact is one of the ways in which that plant spreads, the roots get broken off and washed downstream and spread when the stream banks erode. So those steep stream banks are sometimes exacerbated by a plant such as Japanese knotweed. But it's also true that a forest that is say Norway maple over Japanese stiltgrass or garlic mustard is a much simpler in structure kind of forest than what would naturally occur in our eastern region. It also changes what wildlife resources are available. If you read Doug Tallamy, you know that how important the insects are and that um, if these plants are growing here and they are not feeding our native locally evolved insects, um, that, that, that is cheating the system of, of that food source and, and it, it tends to unravel the food web. But it's the most simple way to put it is that invasive plants physically displace, invasive plants physically can displace some of our native plants. Many of our invasive plants are indeed vines that climb trees and outcompete them for sunlight. And that since many of our preserves are old farms, we can see firsthand that they can halt the process of succession, the natural process from field to forest. You know that if you stop mowing your lawn after a few years, you're going to have wildflowers growing there. Um, goldenrod, for example, even if you didn't plant it, that's uh, the seed is there, it, it, it'll come into your area. After that, a few more years, you'll start getting woody plants, shrubs, and then eventually trees overtake that layer and shade out a lot of what came before and you have a forest. But in the presence of very aggressive invasive plants, things like autumn olive or shrub honeysuckles, multiflora rose, that process may stop at the shrub stage and you never get a forest. And I can show you places in the Philadelphia region where that has occurred, where there's been no management and uh, that place looks the same as it did when I was a kid. Uh, and it's not a forest, it's a shrubland that is all invasive species. It also costs money to manage invasive species. They have impacts on infrastructure like this. This is Japanese akivia growing up uh, um, onto utility lines. And it also changes the way we perceive the space around us. I don't think that the art director for this catalog realized that he was having the people running from kudzu, but that indeed is what they are doing. And then how do we explain to the next generation what is special about the place in which we live if we are growing this very same plants that you can go see anywhere else, almost anywhere else in the United States, the barberry balls in the retail shopping center parking lot, the burning bush in every yard. What's, what's so unique about the Piedmont of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, or I guess the coastal plain of New Jersey um, in, in South Jersey. What, what's so unique about these places that we chose to live here if the flora is the same as anywhere else? This actually isn't bittersweet. This is Japanese akibia again, growing in this uh, development. So I'm gonna show a gallery of invasive plants. I do not mean to demonize any of these plants. They are just remarkably successful. Um, they have a place where they belong, but they can be too aggressive in our local habitats. Norway maple is one of them. It's most, one of the most widely planted shade trees in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it casts a very dense shade under which very little else will grow other than another Norway maple. Uh, it's shallow rooted. It um, leaves out earlier in the spring and holds its leaves later in the fall than any of our native species. And, and so it suppresses a lot of the spring ephemeral wildflowers that might otherwise grow there and reduces the diversity of the canopy as well. One of the easy ways to identify, it, of course, is because it holds its leaves later into the fall. It has these margarine yellow leaves that will be the last thing in the forest. And so that's a good time to tag them for later management. 
tree of heaven, Ailanthus altissima. Um, it uh, often forms a suckering grove like this. Um, is, this is, uh, it looks a little bit like sumac, but is different enough that you can tell them easily. The smell alone is much different. Uh, it's got a very distinctive kind of stinky odor. This happens to be a picture from about 20 years ago on a parcel next to Crow's Nest because we had long since gotten rid of all of our own tree of heaven. Um, but then we added some acres to Crow's Nest, including this grove. And so one of the um, pleasures I had in 2019 and 20 was getting rid of this grove of Ailanthus, which by, the, by this time, 20 years later, each of these was a mature tree. Um, and so I treated each of those at the base with a, a basal bark herbicide, because if you do a mechanical disturbance of this species, it will respond with vigorous resprouting. And then after it's dead, then I cut them down. This also is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly. So if you can get rid of this, I think that helps manage spotted lanternfly populations. Though they, of course, they also feed on other things, but they really seem to like tree of heaven. Japanese akebia is a vine that grows in full shade or full sun. And so it can become a problem in both places. Um, in full shade, it's kind of a blue-green color, like on the left there, and maybe a yellow-green in full sun. So it grows in the understory of the woods and suppresses regeneration of forest trees and anything else that might otherwise grow there. And if you had an old field that you wanted to undergo succession from field to forest, it will prevent that from happening. This is a Riverbend Environmental Education Center a few years ago where they had an enormous akebia problem and it just was overtaking so much of their property. Garlic mustard, I've already mentioned a, a little bit about the, how we did pull it, it's a biennial. So um, in the first year you get the basil rosette and the second year you get these stalks with flowers and plenty of seeds. Um, it does exude a natural fungicide so that uh, all parts of the plant may suppress the mycorrhizal fungi that the trees above depend on. So obviously it's having an impact on the forest floor here where it is a monoculture, but it may also be impacting this health of the trees above because so many of our native trees are dependent upon mycorrhizal fungi for nutrient exchange. So if you're going to get rid of that, um, one of the strategies is to hand pull it and actually remove it physically from the landscape. Um, probably wouldn't attempt it on a, a, a landscape this size as shown, but um, we decided that at the preserve, it was worth experimenting with and, and uh, we've had some success. Porcelain berry is uh, sort of related to grape. It's got very attractive fruit and that's one of the reasons it was imported uh, for ornamental uh, use. Uh, Ampelopsis brevipedunculata, and this is what it can do in the landscape, um, just covering everything. This happens to be at our Green Hills Preserve in Berks County, but it is also very common at Noldy Forest as well, and we've worked pretty hard to try to control it at our Green Hills Preserve. Japanese barberry, a lot of things that are green in April are invasives. Uh, it's a tough month of the year because a lot of that first flush of growth in April is, is non-native species that are adapted to that period of time before the canopy leaves out. So um, Japanese Barberry does feed um, native birds and that is one of the ways that it is spread. Um, but it is also true that it will form a monoculture and that in a Barberry thicket, uh, one study has shown that tick mortality is reduced. And so in a barberry thicket, uh, there are a greater number of ticks and therefore uh, a potential for higher rates of Lyme disease. Uh, so um, that's another good reason to try to manage it. But this grows in full shade. So it, if a bird eats a fruit, even off of one of those burgundy colored cultivars in the landscape and passes that fruit into the woods, that seed could germinate and uh, start a monoculture like this. 
Butterfly bush is one that for years nature centers would plant because it reliably does bring in native or it brings in butterflies and they want to show show off our native butterflies. But none of the caterpillars of our native species can feed on the leaves of this. So you're attracting the adults without giving them a place to reproduce and feed their young. So you're not really doing them a favor. This is Budlia davidii. Uh, and there are better alternatives, things that we could be growing in instead, things like button bush, for example, or if you have room, bottle brush buckeye. That's quite a large shrub, but that is outstanding for bringing in butterflies. Historically, Oriental bittersweet was one of our biggest challenges at the preserve because the vines were chainsaw size and climbing trees and out competing them for sunlight. We've been working on that for years though, and it is not, it's very much still present, but it's not dominating the canopy the way it used to. There is a native bittersweet, um, Celastris scandens. The uh, invasive one is Celastris orbiculatus. Um, and the native one only flowers at the terminal panicle of the vine, whereas the invasive one creates a greater number of fruit by flowering in the axles of the leaves all the way up. This is, as you might guess, used in the flower arrangement trade, and that is one of the ways that at times it is uh, spread around. I know the Garden Club of America uh, has a rule against using um, invasive species in their arrangements and displays. And so they're not the ones doing it, but there is a horticulture trade uh, where people are selling this. Canada thistle is a the perennial uh, thistle, not native to Canada, of course, it's native to Europe. Um, and this one is a noxious weed in Pennsylvania and the United States because it sets seeds that blow in the wind and it's a weed of agronomic land. Um, if one farmer doesn't control it, then no farmer controls it. it uh, and that's one of the reasons they've made laws against growing, selling, or transporting it, because it just um, it, it, uh, it is really aggressive, particularly in disturbed landscapes, meadows, um, roadsides. Uh, it really doesn't compete that well long-term in our well-established meadows. We're able to control it pretty easily there. Um, but in other places, it can be really a problem species. And of course, uh, you may be required by your township as well to control it. Crown vetch was planted for many years by PennDOT along the roadsides. And, you know, the reason why sounds like a good reason that it's invasive. It forms a thick um, cover that doesn't allow anything else to grow through it. And the thinking was that it would improve the line of sight along highways because it's low growing. But it also, it turns out, they found uh, attracts deer. And so the deer um, would be consuming it and sort of lured to the roadsides, which is, of course, a bad thing. So uh, PennDOT does not use this anymore. Autumn olive is a shrub. There's Russian olive, there's autumn olive, uh, different members of the same genus. Um, beekeepers like this plant because it makes a very sweet honey. Uh, but it is a very aggressive invader of old fields and it's got wicked thorns. Uh, we've had to control ones here that were uh, chainsaw sized stems and uh, that's something that we'll always be working on, I think. Burning bush, I think is way overplanted. It's um, really only attractive for a very short time in the fall each year. And um, I think the rest of the year it's not attractive at all. And, and uh, it's because it's way overplanted, you are finding it seeding into a lot of natural landscapes. English ivy is another in our uh, sample list. People ask if it's damaging the tree that it's growing on. I don't think so necessarily. It's rare that I think that it would outcompete the tree for sunlight. It does. Uh, raise the center of gravity of the tree, which is not a good thing. I'm more concerned about what it's doing as a ground cover in this former picnic area, uh, because it's creating a monoculture where nothing else can grow. So if I sound like I'm repeating myself, the problem with these species is all one and the same. They form monocultures that keep other plants from growing there. There are a few more that we'll cover. Privet is uh, the one that People tend to maintain as a hedge, but left to its own, it becomes sort of an unruly large shrub. 
that the birds love the fruit and spread it around quite a bit. And Japanese honeysuckle is the vine. Now there is a native coral honeysuckle, but this is the one that has some flowers that are white and some that are yellow and loved sucking on them as a kid. Um, but it is uh, semi evergreen and can outcompete small trees and shrubs for sunlight, like you see on the right there. There are various shrub honeysuckles as well, like the Amur honeysuckle. Uh, and this was widely planted at one time for um, wildlife food, uh, but there are better choices um, in part because the native insects don't feed upon this. So you're, you're favoring some species of birds, but you're not really supporting the whole food web if you were to grow that. Purple loosestrife, of course, is one for which a, um, a biocontrol has been released. So you don't really see monocultures of it quite as much as you used to. It's still present, but it's not quite as aggressive as it used to be. And in some ways that solves the problem. If it's not quite as aggressive, then it's no longer invasive. And, and it's, you know, it's nothing about the plant itself that's bad. It's the behavior that is bad. Japanese stilt grass, of course, is an annual. So any management of that is an attempt to keep it from setting seed. And you'd have to repeat that for at least five years because the seed is viable for at least that long. We typically see it coming in along paths where there's a disturbance from hikers boots and maybe the weed seed itself was in mud on the lug, lugs of their soles. But over time, it spreads out from those paths and is pretty much um, a dense cover on the entire forest floor. Now, our strategy for this one is in places where it's already widespread, like the floodplain of French Creek, there's really too much of it for us to try to control it. I mean, hundreds of acres. But we have a section of the preserve where it is not yet present or just beginning to show up. That's an uphill, upland uh, forest where we will do anything it takes to keep it from becoming established there. So we go up in August and hand pull some. We might spot spray some. Uh, but we'll do whatever we can to keep that habitat free from Japanese stiltgrass um, before it becomes well established. Miscanthus ornamental grasses, fountain grass is um, attractive, but um, you know people plant it by their mailbox or on either side of their driveway, but it will also show up in our meadows and it's not as attractive in that situation. I have seen homeowner association lands and a power line rights away. Like if you see the power line rights away along I-176 between Morgantown and Redding, it is really common there. Or a very famous population at Valley Forge along the Turnpike. People halfway across the country, uh, I've heard them talking about that population of Miscanthus because it's so dramatic and, and well-known. Um, it is also very flammable. So, and when it burns, it burns with a very black sooty smoke. So I don't think you'd want to burn that. Uh, but um, it's another species for us to try to manage. Phragmites or giant reed. This is one for which there are some native genotypes. Um, there are probably 13 or 14 different genotypes that have been uh, identified from around the world. The one that is invasive in the United States today is one that is of European descent. Uh, and um, so it's, it's in wetlands. Typically, uh, you see it along highways, uh, drainage ditches, um, but it can invade um, naturally occurring wetlands as well. And of course, lesser celandine is one that uh, we can forget that we had at this time of year because it is a spring ephemeral, but you can see it's not your typical spring ephemeral. It creates carpets that just cover the landscape. And so you might guess correctly that there are no other species of spring ephemeral wildflowers growing in that patch of woods. Um, this one is different from our native marsh marigold, Caltha palustris, which is a clump former and does not create these dense carpets and, and actually has a diff different number of petals in the, in the flowers than this, which is Ficaria verna. Uh, it used to be a ranunculus, now it's Ficaria. Glossy buckthorn is another shrub of old fields. Uh, there's actually two species, European buckthorn and glossy buckthorn. And again, if you have this in an old field that's undergoing succession, 
you will likely not have a successful succession from field to forest. And multiflora rose is one that I love to hate because of those wicked recurved thorns. It's easy to get into the plant. It's a little harder to get out of the plant. We do have some native rose species like Rosa, um, swamp, swamp rose, Rosa palustris, but this is the one that has those hairy stipules at the base of the leaf. Uh, that, that's pretty unique uh, as an identification feature. And uh, it often serves as a ladder for other invasives to climb up into the canopy. I had mentioned Japanese knotweed as a uh, herbaceous perennial that dies back to the ground. This can grow eight, 10, 12 feet tall. And of course, if you were trying to manage it, um, you would cut it once in uh, early summer, let it regrow a little bit and then spray it before it gets too tall again, because you certainly don't want to be trying to spray something that's over your head. And mile a minute, um, very distinctive triangular, triangular leaves. Oh, let me get that right. Um, with a perfoliate leaf um, annual so that you're trying to prevent it from setting seed, which it is doing of course right now. Each of those blue fruit that it bears has at least three seeds in it. And um, so it's very invasive. This is another one for which the state has released a biocontrol. And so it is a little bit more slow growing than it might be without that. Uh, the larva of that um, weevil um, live in the stem and slow down that growth by eating the tissue. Uh, but this has been a major problem for us as well. And one last, um, pale swallowwort. Uh, Sinantrum rossicum, used to be called Vincitoxicum rossicum. Um, this is a vine that doesn't get that tall, maybe a meter at most. Uh, but in Canada, it's called the dog swallowing vine because it grows in such dense patches, typically on limestone soils, uh, that if your dog were to run into it, you might never see him or her again. So um, we happen to have I think possibly the only population of it in Chester County at Crow's Nest is more common in Lancaster County, but it is one that can be very aggressive. So I'm gonna talk generally about stewardship and then specifically about invasive plant management. We do a number of different things on our preserves, a lot of restoration, such as converting ponds to wetlands. And here's one of the, the result of one at our Hildesee Preserve near Media, Pennsylvania. Um, taking old farm fields and restoring them to either meadows or forest. We do prescribe fire and maintain our meadows and serpentine barrens this way. On years when we don't do annual mowing of our meadows or, or every other year mowing, we do prescribe fire on about a five year rotation throughout the preserve system. And that requires a high degree of training and equipment and investment, but it is very effective at, at creating the kinds of conditions we want for native warm season grasses to grow. We also collect seed from here. Uh, this is Serpentine Barren in Willsbrook Preserve. And then we have a partnership with Mount Cuba Center to grow seed uh, into plants that then they return some of that to us for restoration. And then they also use uh, themselves elsewhere. We do prescribed grazing for very specific habitat management. Uh, typically these days, it's just two steers, uh, but we're using them basically to eat the uh, reed canary grass and other competing vegetation. That's reed canary grass that you see in the, in the picture there. They love it, uh, but it creates too dense a monoculture. Uh, and so we can open it up in wet meadows that we can't get our own equipment into. So it's a partnership. We do a hazard tree management program because we know that every tree someday will fall. And if it's near a target like a road or a utility line, we want to manage when and where that tree will fall. And of course we do wildlife management. When it comes to deer, all the tools are on the table. Uh, we do fencing, tree tubes, tree cages, and direct hunting, uh, both archery and shotgun to try to keep the deer populations at a level that, is, uh, that allows for forest regeneration to occur. Now, of course, in this area uh, of Northern Chester County, 
into Montgomery County and Berks County. In 2018, we had an outbreak of epizootic hemorrhagic disease, which decimated the deer population. And so we are witnessing a rare opportunity for regeneration that would probably would not otherwise be occurring. We have really lush growth because there are fewer deer feeding on it. The deer will rebound in population, but for right now, we've been able to grow things that we might not otherwise be able to grow. And of course, as I mentioned, we do a lot of invasive species, species management. Here's mile a minute uh, growing on shrubs. So it's fair to say that our work is perpetual. Ideally, we are working with nature because if you're working against nature, you're probably not going to be successful. Ideally, we use succession as a tool, the natural process under which uh, land undergoes conversion to forest in our part of the world. That's uh, something that is common and naturally occurring. And if we can use that shade as a tool to re to suppress some invasive plants, we will. And if a desirable plant is occupying a particular time and space, uh, then it can't simultaneously be uh, occupied by an invasive species. So to the extent that we can restore things by replanting, that helps us be successful. Uh, I say that we should always do, we should take the Hippocratic Oath for land stewardship, first do no harm. That means not spreading invasive species, not planting invasive species, cleaning our equipment so that we don't inadvertently introduce something we didn't mean to, and also not driving across that wet meadow and creating ruts that might change the hydrology of a site in a way that we hadn't planned. Some disturbance is natural and desirable, but unplanned disturbance may have unintended effects. For each of our preserves and your lands, what you would uh, create sample, you would create goals. Uh, for us uh, at Crow's Nest, we're trying to maintain habitat continuity with adjoining lands. We're part of the Hopewell Big Woods. We're adjacent to French Creek State Park, Hopewell Furnace National Historic Site, State Game Lands 43. And we're trying to be a good neighbor and create the same kind of habitat that will help them manage their habitats. Because I think our land is more valuable for wildlife habitat because it's part of this larger landscape. There are also plants that we want to be able to show people as representative of the Piedmont flora. And so we try to create the conditions under which they will survive. And then there are some rare species that we are trying to create the conditions or maintain the conditions under which we can still grow them. From those goals, we have these objectives well, we try to monitor what we have, and that involves early detection, rapid response, about which I'll say more shortly. We uh, try to prevent new invasions uh, by not introducing uh, propagules of some of these species. We try to reduce the impact of the invasions we already have. We know we can't get rid of all invasive species, but what can we grow in this site despite, despite the fact that there are some invasive species present? and then restore and replant areas as needed. So to implement those objectives, we have these strategies. We maintain an inventory and map of the species found on the preserve, both invasive and desirable native species. We prioritize our efforts because you can't do it all. We only use best management practices and, and we don't experiment ourselves with what those best management practices may be so much as rely on university and government research on what, what really works. You could describe what we do as integrated vegetation management. If you're familiar with integrated pest management, this is a similar idea, but for managing weeds. And that is to establish thresholds of tolerance for your invasive species or your pest species, uh, because it's likely not gonna be zero tolerance. And then choosing the least toxic method to manage that problem uh, as part of a larger program. And then if it's not working, evaluate and adjust. There are cases where we have changed strategies because they, weren't, they were too labor intensive or were not working well. For example, mile a minute uh, in 2005, this is a map of the preserve with wooded areas in green, farm fields and meadows in a light green, and then our known populations at that time 
of mile a minute in red. And we came to the conclusion that we had too much of it to, to, main, to manage by hand pulling. And so we turned to other strategies such as spraying in order to increase our effectiveness. Also, we don't do a lot of ripping things out by the roots anymore. Um, back years ago, we would rip out multiflora rows, roots and all with a track, tractor and chain or other large piece of equipment and then get rid of it. And that does get rid of it, roots and all, but you're creating the disturbance that is then uh, often colonized by things like Japanese stiltgrass or garlic mustard. And you get on what they call the invasive treadmill where you're substituting a more difficult problem for what might've been a less difficult problem. In all of our management, we try to retain what I call cues to care, some sort of way of messaging that this is an intentional landscape. This is not just a weedy area that was neglected. This is actually a wildflower meadow. Um, and one of the ways you do that is by putting a bench to sit and enjoy the view or mow a trail through it that invites people to wander through or interpret a signs, even if they're laminated paper explaining what you're doing and why. Every time we do a prescribed fire on our preserve, I make up a laminated paper sign and show like this burned out area is being managed for X, Y, and Z. And uh, that way people know when they see it, what, what it is. And then I take it down after um, a few weeks because everything has greened up so quickly that you would not even know that it was burned. I mentioned that we use best management practices and there's a lot available on the web um, from places like Morris Arboretum, uh, Penn State Cooperative Extension as to what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and so we try to adhere to those techniques. I also mentioned that we prioritize by geographic location. There are places that have extraordinary resources. It actually makes more sense to start in that patch of woods where there are fewer invasive species and work your way out to the edges where there are likely more invasive species, a greater number of invasive species, because you're more likely to be successful in that interior forest and, and be able to do it with less work where there are fewer invasives. It may be very satisfying to work along an edge and there may be a good other argument for working along an edge, a high vis visibility location, for example, but it takes a lot more work to be successful. So we tend to work to start with the most intact habitats. And it also makes sense that if there's an uphill population and a downhill population, you start with the uphill population or upstream population so that you, your site is not reinvaded by invasive species after you finish. Um, there are some invasive species that have greater ecological impact than others. I think Japanese barberry, in, for one, because it grows in such dense shade, uh, it is one that has a great ecological impact. And then if there's no chance of controlling it, then we probably don't want to waste resources trying. And then among individuals, I've worked with a lot of volunteer groups that were willing to hand pull seedlings of Atlantis but we're not willing to use herbicide to kill the, the mature tree that was dropping the seed in the first place. You really have to start with the seed source and, and then you have time to catch up with the tiny seedlings. This is the invasion curve that invokes early detection rapid response. By the time you realize you have a problem, it may be that much harder to manage. Uh, and so the idea is you catch the invasive species problem early when eradication is possible or at least containment is possible. By the time you get over towards the red side of the curve, um, the area infested is greater and the control costs are much greater. So there's much less chance of success there. This is actually ad 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 adopted from a diagram in Australia. A curve that I like much better is where the first few years may take a great deal of effort, but over time you get down to a low level maintenance uh, amount of work. And we have places on the preserve where we've been able to do that. We had Phragmites, giant reed growing in a wetland adjacent to a farm field where the first couple of years it took a full day of spraying for me to manage. 
Now I'm down to just a few minutes a year, and I certainly can spare a few minutes a year to, to maintain that area free from Phragmites. There are various online planning tools, things like um, IMAP invasives that lets you input um, observations of invasive species that are then checked by experts, and also lets you input information on what you are doing to manage it so that you can do project management, uh, tracking it. Uh, you know, if, if rather than create your own spreadsheet from scratch, there is this tool out there that is very effective. And it also works on mobile devices. This, for example, is a, an entry for porcelain berry at our Green Hills Preserve that I did in 2016, um, just to record that I had it and, and that I was working on it. There are a number of different management techniques. We group them loosely into mechanical, chemical, biological, and cultural techniques. Um, mechanical for us is a lot of the times either hand pulling or more frequently cutting the base of something. And for larger cutting, you have larger tools. Um, this separates the photosynthetic part of the plants from its roots. The roots will re-sprout, maybe repeatedly. Uh, and so you have to be dedicated to cutting repeatedly to exhaust the reserves in those roots or supplement with some other technique as well as cutting. But cutting is pretty much the first step and we use our volunteers a lot for that. Um, and um, so it works really well to combine the handwork with the mechanic, the machine mechanical work and uh, potentially chemical herbicides as well. So I mentioned larger tools. We have brush cutters, chainsaws, things like that, that can help us. Uh, my favorite tool is actually one that has uh, interchangeable tips like this uh, brush knife on the left and the um, chainsaw tip on the right. This allows you to cut anything up to probably 12 inches diameter without having to crawl under on your hands and knees like you would with a chainsaw. Um, it's, it's like a weed whip engine on a stick uh, with interchangeable tips for the size of the material you're cutting. And um, it's sort of like a lightsaber. We, we just go in and uh, cut things and are very effective at separating the top of the plant from the bottom of the plant. And when that's done, you have a layer where the vines are cut as high as you can reach and as low as you can reach. If you don't repeat that, and if you don't add another control method, it will grow back. It will grow back up into the canopy like you see on the right there. Um, and so you, you have to take further steps, either cutting it again, cutting it every year, or following up with an herbicide uh, treatment. And we use sort of targeted chemicals and targeted um, tools so that we're not broadcasting herbicides over large landscapes. We are applying it to a specific plant and using a chemical that is either a, a broadleafed herbicide or um, a, a, a non-specific herbicide, but applying it only to a specific plant. Um, I can talk at a completely different presentation on herbicides themselves, but I'm happy to also answer questions about that because it is something that concerns many people. Um, we feel that the threat is greater from some of these invasive species than from a carefully applied herbicide. And so, um, and since I'm the one doing it, I, I want to be careful about how I use chemicals myself. So only ones that we feel are safe for the people applying them safe for the landscape in which they're being used. So I'm happy to address that more, but I'm uh, gonna show a picture of how little can be used um, in a basal bark or st cut stump application. And instead of spraying the entire tree and having that drip all over the landscape, you can apply a very small amount of herbicide. This picture was taken at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum and um, that's, uh, buckthorn that it has been applied to both of those, uh, the single stem and the cut stumps. And of course, there are biological controls which entail both the greatest chance of success and also the greatest risk because they don't need to be reapplied. You release them and they propagate themselves, but also the greatest risk because once they're released, they cannot be recalled. And so 
That's Gellerid cell beetles on purple loosestrife at the right. And that has been a fairly successful biocontrol. But over time, over the history of the world, there have been a greater number of biocontrol failures than successes. So it has to be carefully researched, has to be an insect that is so specific that it will not uh, eat uh, other plants that are not the invasive plant you're trying to target. Um, so we don't really use biocontrol ourselves on any of our preserves, although we benefit from when the state, for example, released the biocontrol for mile a minute, that definitely helped us uh, in how fast that it was growing. And then there are cultural methods, and that's specifically creating the conditions under which the de desirable species you want are, uh, will thrive. And so prescribed fire can be um, considered a cultural control because it is um, volatilizing off some of that excess nutrients. We want rich soil in our gardens. We don't necessarily want rich soils in our meadows. Uh, poverty grass, our native andropogon, is called that because it will grow on poor soils. And so if you're trying to grow a meadow, a native meadow, for example, prescribed fire is a great way to create those conditions. Um, and also planting for shade and competition. So volunteers love to plant trees. And we're jumpstarting the process of succession um, by planting and then maintaining um, those trees. Now, at first, of course, it looks more like a plantation than a forest. This is our Binky Lee Preserve, probably about 15 years ago. And if you go there today, a lot of this is closed canopy forest. Uh, but so this is planted in rows for easy maintenance, at least to start. But the idea is once the shade is there, uh, the forest will start to reproduce itself and the seed source is there and it will take less maintenance in the long run. And the reason why we're doing this is so that we can show the next generation of conservationists what is special about the place in which we live. And so we run programs for kids at Crow's Nest, a summer camp and after school and homeschooled nature clubs. And I have my contact information there. I'm happy to answer questions uh, anytime. Just shoot me an email. Um, and I'm also happy to um, address the questions that I think are in the chat now. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing. And um, so let's see the questions in the chat. Oh, the lightsaber. OK, um, the, it's called a combi tool. It's made by steel. Um, and it is available in both gasoline and battery powered versions. And the implements that attach to it are compatible with both. Um, and so you could, um, like we right now, we have gasoline powered ones, but down the road, we we'll, may have battery powered ones, uh, which I believe is the future where a lot of that technology is going. And so it'll be a little quieter and um, cleaner. Um, so um, any steel dealer, would sell that. They sell a few different sizes of model um, and it's combi, K-O-M-B-I. And I've always said, if you're gonna buy just one of these power tools, buy one that you can interchange the tips on so that you can simultaneously have a string trimmer, a brush cutter, a chainsaw without having to buy three different engines. Um, and um, so that's, I, I put my money where my mouth is. That's the kind of tool that I have myself. Um, another question. Hmm. More in place, is, it, is it more important to replace weeded patches with native plants than how the weeding is done? Hmm. I think how the weeding is done is pretty important because if, if there's a lot of soil disturbance, you're just going to be trading one invasive species for another or, or the same one back again. Um, that said, I mean, there are clearly going to be places where just weeding it, pulling it, and replanting is going to benefit you. So it, it's, it's hard to say specifically. Um, but we have really gotten away from anything that causes soil disturbance. It just has not, has not worked well for us to, to churn up the soil. We can be much more successful working with what's already the seed bank of native species that's already there and, um, and just editing out those species that we don't want to have. I was an English major, so that's, that's the analogy I come up with. 
Um, oh, okay. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> and thanks for volunteering too. Any other question? And shout shout out or. Um, Dan, Audrey asked, "What do you recommend we do with berries from invasives such as the myelominate?" Yes. So myelominate, ideally, um, we if you were going to pull it or weed whip it or spray it, uh, do that early enough in the season before it sets seed. Of course, right now it's in full fruit. And every time you go to pull it, a lot of that seed falls on the ground. So um, while you might be able to collect a good bit of that seed, enough I think will fall that you may be just having a fresh crop of it next year anyway. Uh, you will prevent the birds from eating it and spreading it to a new area. Um, and so if it's only in one spot and you're prepared to manage that spot again next year, then yeah, maybe just mow it down or weed whip it and, and just deal with that one spot. But chances are it's already in the neighborhood anyway. And uh, so we try to hit it early in the season. And by this time of year, you know, where it's already established, we're not doing as much with it. Um, one of the advantages of the um, biocontrol uh, weevil that they introduced is that it starts it grows more slowly and it starts flowering a little later in the season. It's sort of like an indeterminate tomato. It'll just keep flowering and fruiting from the beginning of its flowering season until frost. And so the longer it goes, the more it, it creates. Um, and um, the biocontrol weevil has delayed that fruit set from June into July. So that has bought us almost three weeks of extra time to, to get in there and control it before it is actually setting fruit. Um, but yeah, that, that is a, a difficult plant. Uh, we have some other questions mm -hmm. about some specific invasives. Um, what would you recommend to control Japanese stilt grass in the midst of a planting of natives like Minarda? Yeah, so if if it's a more, if you're willing to treat it like a garden area and just weed it out, um, do that before uh, it flowers in August. So like um, the end of August, early September, we're hand we want it all hand pulled out of there before then. Um, it's just a matter of how much work you're willing to go to. I know researchers will say, you know, these methods work on our meter square plots. The problem is we don't have a meter square plot. We have hundreds of acres of it. Uh, and so we really have to pick and choose where we're gonna bother managing it and where we're not gonna bother managing it. A lot of the places where we have Japanese stillgrass, I mean, the problem with Japanese stillgrass is it forms this dense cover through which not many other things grow. But what if we plant desirable species in that location, uh, shrubs or small trees um, per in particular, um, so that we still have the Japanese still grass, but we also have the other species that we desired to have as well. And so that's, that's mainly what we're doing in those places. Dan, um, what, that was my question. What I was asking is these plantings of natives are too thick to get into and weed. In other words, if I crawl into it, I'm knocking over Monarda to pull the Japanese stilt grass out. So they are um, garden areas as opposed to, you know, swaths. But the stilt grass, I just can't even get to it. Then I guess I'd leave it. I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's okay. Tough, I didn't know call. if you had encountered you, that. You could, I mean, you could definitely damage the native species and create a gap that yep. is going to reinvade. So it may be that's better what I'm worried about. to let okay. it go. I mean, if you have the Monarda growing there, then that's successful in itself. True, true. Um, how about any particular time of year to address autumn olive and Japanese knotweed? Okay, there's going to be two answers there. Um, autumn olive, you can cut down at any time of year. Although if you're going to cut down, um, say in the spring, it's going to regrow vigorously because that's the time of year when the roots are pushing forth. Uh, and so your success will be shorter lived. If you cut things down from midsummer into the fall, that's when plants are taking their nutrients down to the roots to store for the winter. And so you will be depriving them of those nutrients. So you will probably weaken the plant 
in a fewer number of years if you cut in midsummer into the fall. That said, you may cut whenever the pruners are in your hand or the saw is in your hand. Um, we do invasive management year round and we still, we, we have to, because there's no other way we keep up with it then. And so um, just know that if you cut in the spring, um, it's gonna grow back quickly and that you're gonna have to get back there again sooner than you might otherwise. Uh, but woody plants, we're typically cutting them year round. And then if we have the opportunity to paint the stump with an herbicide, uh, we'll do that. And that will prevent it usually from resprouting. And in fact, I mean, that's a good wintertime activity. Basal bark herbicides will work in the wintertime uh, as long as the base, the cut stump or the base of the plant is not under snow. Uh, so sometimes it's a matter of marking a spot and returning to it in the winter when there's a little more time because uh, we're not mowing trails in the winter. We have a little bit more time. Uh, and you know the, the, the manufacturer of the herbicide will say that it works at any time of year. Sometimes with a winter application um, of a basal bark herbicide, the plant will leaf out in the spring and you think, oh, that was not successful. But then shortly thereafter, those leaves will drop off and the plant will die. So sometimes you'll see that as well. Uh, for Japanese knotweed, since that's an herbaceous plant, it's a slightly different strategy. Um, it's gonna come up in the spring and then around June, you're gonna cut it down and let it regrow into July. And then you're going to sp spray that uh, re-sprout. Um, and that would respond better to a glyphosate herbicide, uh, like a wetland approved version like Rodeo, um, that, that will then brown out that growth. And then you'll probably end up having to repeat it for two or three years. The problem, if you try to mow it, you'd have to almost mow it weekly to exhaust that plant. And so you'd basically have a lawn right up to the edge of your stream and that's not desirable either. Um, so um, I think that answers those two. Questions. Yeah, that is great, Dan, thank you. Uh, Michelle, who's been very active um, with, at a, at a legislative level with um, invasives is asking if natural lands are active in the PA Noxious Weed Committee and Invasives Council. No, I'm not. Um, at, at one point, I've, I've been to a couple of committee hearings. I did attend something that was on a, a Zoom meeting, um, but um, we do a fair amount of education, but not much in the way of advocacy or legislation. Um, I do think that Pennsylvania is lagging behind other states when it comes to legislation and that um, you know, while legislation is sort of a blunt tool, it is effective in places like Maryland and Virginia in preventing um, the sale and spread of some of these species, because a lot of them are major nursery trade um, species. But then, you know, it's also that's also someone's livelihood. So you have to sort of tread carefully there. Yeah, Dan, my question was, um... We've, we've actually heard from some folks, um, Brandywine Conservancy was one where they just, they just don't want to really get into that advocacy position um, from their group's perspective. And I'm curious because when you're, you're such an expert and you have these pictures and these real life examples of what you know you're dealing with day in and day out and it would just be so powerful to have your voice and other voices at the table because we are starting to make momentum get some momentum here we got the ban for japanese barberry although two years delayed but there are so many more plants on the list and um if you're not if your organization isn't um just opposed to that I, I'd love to reach out to you and just, if you just drop a note, public comments are, we're so impactful in July and public comments again in October to ban calorie pair um, are, we're, we're seeing a huge change with this committee and the Invasive, Invasive Species Council with all the public advocacy going on right now. 
So. I would be interested in participating at some level if you if you can get me some information. Sure, thank you. Uh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, um, Marilyn is asking, she says, I have too much Canada goldenrod in my meadow. What's the best way to deal with a native plant that is very mm -hmm. beneficial, but might be just too out competing too much? That's a good question. Uh, I, we've had a preserve manager of one of our preserves really thinks that uh, dogbane, uh, opossum, is too aggressive in his meadow. And so um, it's a native species, but it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. It's forming a monoculture. And goldenrod is also very successful. Um, but of course you don't wanna get rid of all of it. So in that case, I think I might try mowing a little pattern of trails or um, you know, turning that monocultural meadow into a mosaic of smaller patches so that there are gonna be patches of, of um, goldenrod, but there'll also be patches that are maybe by mowing, you're creating the conditions that are a little better for grasses. So maybe you have patches of other things as well. Um, Is a late meadow cut something that could work? Later than if, if I have a, um, a March, April meadow cut, should I also maybe do one in June or July? We would let, wait until July, until after ground nesting species are out of there. Right. And then we would mow high, like eight inches or higher. Um, but yeah, I would set it back a little bit and give other species an opportunity to, to grow there. We, all, we also are mowing our meadows in um, late winter. Um, it's always a game to see like how late will the ground still be frozen. So we actually start in January. We try to be finished by March. Um, and then if we don't get to it, we could then return to that site in July and mow, or we'll just let it go another year because it's totally acceptable to have things on a, on a two or three year rotation for, for the bees, for the native bees and for other species. Um, it, as long as the invasives aren't getting too bad in the meantime. So it's a bit of a balance. That's helpful. Thank you. That is great. Um, another question in regards to a native plant that we have a love hate relationship with some of us more than others. Um, would a basil bark herbicide work on poison ivy also? That's a good question. It should. However, poison ivy is probably growing up a desirable tree. And so if you got any of that herbicide on the desirable tree, you would inadvertently kill that tree. So um, we don't, we would not use a basal bark probably on poison ivy. We cut it quite a bit. Um, just, I, I don't even cut high and cut low. I just cut a little uh, inch, inch wide notch. Um, and that I can see easily. And uh, that kills everything above the notch. And then if I have to, um, I'll come back with a foliar spray and spray the poison ivy below that cut or when it regrows a foliar spray because that foliar spray is not gonna penetrate the bark of the tree. Um, oh, okay, thank you. We have so much poison ivy, it's insane. Thank you. And I think, you know, you could use a broadleaf specific herbicide as well uh, that would not kill the grasses. Um, that's usually pretty successful. Um, you know, a glyphosate is gonna kill whatever it touches. So, um, so that has to be a, a, applied more carefully. Um, um, Thank you for uh, several techniques that maybe Judy can use to protect George from the poison ivy. Um, we also had, and you, okay. Um, we also had somebody asking about how to get rid of English ivy. Mm, English I ivy. I saw a neighbor down my road hand pulling it off of their um, sycamore tree and taking with it a lot of the bark. So I'm guessing maybe that's not the best way, but I don't know, you tell me. That's a really good question too, because that gives me the opportunity to say that when we cut vines, we don't actually pull them out of the trees. We cut vines and leave them up there um, because oftentimes you, you'll break branches um, when you're pulling them down. So English ivy, I would cut it around the trunk at a comfortable level. And so everything above that is dead and I would just leave it. It's unsightly for a little while 
Um, but that's the way I get it off the trunk of the tree. Um, and then maybe I would do that down at the ground level so that the trunk is completely clear of, of English ivy. And then the challenge begins because English ivy has that thick waxy leaf that is very resistant to herbicide. And um, so you're probably gonna want something that has a non-ionic surfactant in it that helps the herbicide stick to the leaf and helps break down that waxy coating. There are various adjuvants that you can add to an herbicide that help um, break down that waxy coating. Um, once you actually get the herbicide down to the leaf core, then it will work. But, but a lot of it will just beat up and roll off like a waxed car. Uh, so that's a really tough one to actually control. Now, what I'm hearing is it's really important to match the plant to the right control, whether it be mechanical and the right timing uh, versus chemical and the specific most uh, effective, least toxic option that you can come up with, which um, we also have someone asking, have you had any experience with the less toxic sprays like Scythe or Iron X? I've heard of Scythe, I haven't used it, and I've never heard of Iron X. Um, I'm assuming they probably have things like vinegar, acetic acid, and, and clove oil, perhaps, as, as like natural materials that also um, burn down leaves. I'm, I have used a couple things that do have those natural uh, materials in them. The caution I have is that um, at the levels at which they kill the leaves of plants, it's very dangerous to the person applying it. Like um, the, the chance of that acid getting in your eye and causing eye damage, it's actually more dangerous than a lot of the things that are sold as your traditional chemical herbicides. And also I would add that some of the natural herbicides that I've used, um, they may be acidifying the soil where you spray them. And I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. Um, and also I know I used some around galvanized cages that I used to protect trees from deer and it ate through the metal. So you can only imagine that um, <laughs> just because something's a natural material doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. Um, so I, I, you know, I stick mainly to a glyphosate herbicide for a non-selective control that's water-based um, and I, I can, purchased that in a formulation that is safe to use near water. Um, and um, so I would use that. And then a broadleaf water-based herbicide uh, where, so that I can spray broadleaf weeds without having to kill everything. Um, and for that, I've actually changed over the years what I use. Um, I'm now using a product called Bastlan, B-A-S-T-L-A-N. Um, it replaces Garlon 3A. Um, it is a triclopyr choline instead of a triclopyr amine. I don't really know what those things mean, but the difference is Garlon 3A can cause severe eye damage, whereas Vaslan does not. Um, and so it has a different label. It has a caution label instead of a danger label. And caution is better than danger. Um, so I use that for broadleaf herbicides, and I really don't use much herbicide to, to be honest, but, but when, I, when I have to resort to that, I'm using it in a very small area targeted to a specific plant. So those are two water-based solutions, one that will kill everything and one that will just kill broadleaf plants, including poison ivy. Um, and then as I should probably comment a little bit more about the basal bark and cut stump using a oil-based herbicide. Now that is a broadleaf herbicide, it won't really kill grass, although you know it'll slow it down a little bit. Those I primarily use in the winter because you don't want to use them at all when it's hot outside, because those oils can volatize and get into the air and actually crinkle the leaves of canopy trees nearby. Things like tulip tree and spice bush are very susceptible. And uh, I've seen places on National Parkland where a basal bark herbicide was used, uh, an oil-based herbicide was used to control barberry in the understory, and they ended up killing some of the canopy trees of tulip poplar. 
inadvertently. So, um, and that was because they did it in the summer when it was hot and, and maybe they used too much of it or sprayed too much at one time. Like, I don't feel like I have to control all of it in one shot. I'll happily do some now, some later so that you're not applying too much all at once. Because the, the chemicals can inadvertently kill things you didn't mean to kill. So, so they have to be cared, they have to be used very carefully. Well, that's great, Dan. Thank you so much. Everyone is commenting that um, you had such useful information. They took notes, were learning and trying to combat these things on the lands that we can control so that they're not escaping and making your job worse. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. I am going to shut this chat box down, guys. So if you have other chats, Somebody please remind me to check those again. I'm gonna share my screen to finish up the few things that we have um, as a chapter. Oh, so upcoming opportunities in case um, you haven't gotten any emails from Wild Ones National, there's still registration for Heather Holmes uh, presentation on WASP. If you don't have her book yet, which is pictured there, the green book, it's amazing. Um, I highly recommend going out in your native plants and looking at all the amazing wasps that are there and then opening her book and learning more about them. It is just a pleasure to be able to identify them and um, read her information about the native plants that both attract them and support them and learning more about the almost host specific relationships that uh, bees and wasps have. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, some really cool upcoming things that our chapter is hoping to do. Uh, we've been throwing around the ideas of creating a chapter t-shirt. Uh, we want to have them locally screen printed. So we're supporting local businesses. We want them to be made of US grown organic cotton to be responsible consumers. We want to provide men's and women's um, sizes and cuts and have two or three color options. We would be really excited if one of our members would want to design our logo. So if you have some artistic talent and you want to make the face of our chapter, um, throw some ideas out there with us, email us some ideas or some, you know, if you're looking to see kind of what direction we wanna go on. Uh, if you don't have any artistic talent like I don't, but you know some gifted artists and they want to volunteer their time to come up with a great logo, let us know. Um, we also want to start growing some seeds um, into plants that we use for future sales and projects. So if you are interested in volunteering to grow seeds that uh, we as a chapter purchase, and uh, you would be able to keep a portion of what germinates into plants and the rest would be for the chapter to um, either have as plant sales, as giveaways at tabling events, as future projects. We have some projects that we're hoping to get in on next year. So that would be a way that you can help support. We plan to make this uh, kind of a step-by-step -step process where we're learning together and growing together. These plants, we would get together to do the winter seed sowing to, you know, kind of work as a committee to compare notes on how they're growing to um, support each other in what we should be doing each step of the way, then get together to be doing potting up and, and all of those things. So it would, we'd be looking to form a committee uh, within our chapter that wants to be doing kind of each of these things, really the t-shirts, the um, seed growing. Uh, we also want to partner with some schools to work on curriculum, both as after school programs, as homeschool um, opportunities to really teach the next generation why native plants are important and make sure that that is 
being part of their natural sciences curriculum. We will also be, we really want to start a book club. This was an amazing idea that Michelle had earlier and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just one more slide, I think. But um, I also wanted to say that we have some potential partnerships going on with the Phoenixville School District on a memorial native plant garden so that we can uh, give them some guidance and most likely donate or grant them some plants so that we can show the life that native plants can provide uh, as a memorial to some of their students. We also have Audrey working really hard um, coming up with some project potentials for us through East, Park, East Pikeland Township who are putting in and adding to additional parks uh, in their township. And we wanna make sure that native plants are getting in the ground and that we're educating the public about the importance of that. That's, that's what we do as a chapter. So we've got some other potential outreach programs um, to link up with through that. So some of these things link directly to uh, our chapter's budget. Uh, we have over $700 in our account right now. And that's money that is partially from your dues. And so we wanna be responsible with what we're doing with that money. And we wanna make sure that it's meeting our chapter objectives, which are to get native plants in the ground and educate the public about that. So uh, some the seed project and um, actually adopting and, and uh, partnering with schools to get plants in the ground are some of the ways that we will spend that money. The, t-shirts will most likely be kind of fundraiser things that we'll do um, that we can open them up to chapter members first and then depending on um, popularity and things we can sell them as fundraisers for tabling events. I know that all of the events that I was personally at last month I have some t-shirts that I purchased from other organizations that have catchy slogans or have, um, you know, the, the important ideas that we're trying to spread. People wanted to buy them. And I was like, no, it's, it's just for decoration. It's just, you know, kind of goes with the theme. Uh, but I kind of made bank selling my own t-shirts, like just right off the table. Um, so we have money that we want to spend on these things. If you have ideas and projects that you would like to see that money go towards, shoot us an email. The last couple months we've talked about um, meeting people who wanted to be more involved and we've been very fortunate that Anne has reached out and wants to be more involved. Uh, we have not had anyone else step up to say they wanna be president. So uh, it looks like most of our board members are gonna stay in place. If at any time you are interested in taking a position, reach out to us, let us know. Uh, I want to talk about this book club for a minute. Um, it would of course be focused on native plants and our gardening conservation books. Michelle will host it if we have a group of five or six people who are interested over the winter, which is the only time I get to read, which is probably like all of you, if you spend the majority of your time talking to your plants like I do. So when they're sleeping in the winter, I get to catch up on some reading. So I will at least be one of those five or six people that are interested in geeking out over some good books with good friends who understand this whole obsession. Um, it's suggested that we do one book every six weeks, which is good because I even in winter, still wander outside and forget to do the things I'm supposed to do. So I need a lot of time to actually get my homework done. And then we gather every three weeks to discuss. So about two Zoom meetings uh, for every book. Those are some rough guidelines. If you're interested, again, reach out, let us know if you would be excited about this opportunity also. 
I have some fun updates on a project, our first native plant garden adoption that Michelle headed up at the Hillsdale um, Elementary School. Last month, I shared the hard work of getting that those beds prepped. This is in the middle of the planting. Um, even though these pictures look very um, controlled and organized and quiet, Michelle can attest that there were lots and lots of second graders running around doing the um, quote unquote planting with some, some supervision by some harried teachers and Michelle teaching them all about these things with the volunteers there doing, doing the hard work also, but uh, it was anything but quiet. And it now serves as a beautiful beginning stages of teaching people, not just the second graders that helped or even the fifth graders that are gonna walk by this, but the parents that are going to see all of these amazing plants in the spring and learn about what they can put in their property to look so beautiful and attract so many butterflies and bees and, and things. And the flags are such a good idea um, that everybody should take note of that, the little pinwheels or a certain way to mark your plants. I use um, popsicle sticks and little bamboo pieces because it's really easy to think that the plant you loved planting in the fall is a weed in the spring and pulling it out. So if you put a flag or a little something by the plants, uh, it helps you remember where they are and not to pull them. Uh, this is just a reminder that we have our upcoming meetings and uh, we are closing out our year with fall dividing and winter seed sowing. I am, that's everything I have to share. I'm gonna leave this up there and anybody who has any questions, uh, I'm gonna check the chat real quick here. I'd okay. like to add whoever helps design our t-shirt, I would gladly throw in some honey to them from Hatrick Honey. Is there any other t-shirts that would like to donate some honey to the t-shirt designer? Feel free to join in. Great idea. Patrick Hummy has been a wonderful sponsor and supporter of our chapter, whether our members know it or not. So thank you, Patrick Hummy. <laughs> and, and as I know that George and I are beekeepers and I can't speak to anybody else on the call, we'd also be happy to donate some honey. <laughs> it sounds like a honey basket is going to the, the proud um, crafter of our chapter logo. I love this. Yes. And I'll be had I, I would love to help with um, growing seeds for selling. Wonderful. So um, what we're going to do with all these new great ideas. Actually, let me go back to that slide of the upcoming things. That way people can get a reminder of maybe what they might be interested in. If you're interested in any of these things or, or um, interested in mm -hmm. joining the committee or taking a leading role or just in participating, shoot us an email. Um, the, what if I go back even further to the email? You're, you can always email, you can always email the wild ones of SEPA, the regular email address, and I will send it where it needs to go. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the same with Susan, if she gets emails at that address and, and we need to parlay them on. Um, it was a really fun meeting, guys. Anything else that I, I feel like I'm forgetting something, Susan. Was I supposed to bring up something else? No? Wasn't there supposed to be a treasurer report? Um, <laughs> we covered it briefly that we have over, we have about 750-ish dollars right now in our account. But in the future, we would like to have a treasurer's report kind of at each meeting. Um, but we need to talk about that because there 
recorded and kind of open access. So yeah, I, I think that's success. more for board our board meetings rather than yeah the the others. But I'm happy to summarize. I like having um, our members knowing that we have a ballpark of x amount of dollars to do projects with so that if they have ideas and they have access to hoas that they know that we uh, have some funds that we can work with to make things happen uh, and we're not just you know all ideas right it's not a club the purpose of the organization is to get native plants in the ground and the best way to do that is to help other organizations that can't do it themselves, don't have the funds, don't have the knowledge. And that's what we're for. I'm not putting numbers in the written uh, meeting highlights, so there'll be nothing posted online about the amount in the bank account. That's just information for members, as you said, Jesse. So that members know this, members need to know the status of the organization. They're entitled to that knowledge. Okay. What are the negatives of discussing club funds kind of publicly? What, I'm, I'm not aware of the negatives of that. I don't know that there are any. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we, we can easily go over each time what the balance is and any expenditures because all the expenditures have been, you know, things that, that would have been discussed previously. Uh, we, we purchased the the um, apron for the tables, which for the events, and um, we purchased uh, the table, $35 fee at the Phoenixville mm -hmm. event, green team event. So, you know, just sharing with folks what we've spent and what comes in from membership dues quarterly from uh, national is I see no concerns with that. And then we really do want to start talking about rather than we, we're not here to accumulate the money, the 750 that we have, what are the projects we should be focused on? And, and how can we spend that responsibly, invest that responsibly to keep pushing our mission forward? Right, and there, there isn't so much money that anyone's gonna think, oh, I have to keep an eye on the board to make sure nobody is, you know, wandering away with any of it. We belong to another organization that has what is to me a ridiculously large amount of money. Um, and, you know, you think things like that, but $750, nobody's gonna think, oh, uh, the board's gonna abscond with it or anything. But there, there, that's a good point, Judy. There are chapters who have accumulated um, thousands and tens of thousands. And that's not our purpose is to accumulate and to invest or earn a, on that money. It is to reinvest any membership dues or any money we earn through you know, if we grow seeds and plants and we, or people donate to us, they can donate to a chapter as well, then we, we want to use the money. So um, it's our first year, we haven't had a whole lot to spend, but, you know, we get these quarterly dues in every quarter and it will continue to grow if we don't use it. So we should plan to use it. We have been uh, blessed to have amazing speakers who have uh, volunteered their time and their expertise to share their knowledge with us. There may be times that we will use that money for um, a presenter who expects to be paid for their, their knowledge, who runs you know, a business, maybe that is their livelihood. So educational purposes are potential ways to spend some of this money. We may want to, in the future, um, host a seminar or host a, an event um, that will cost money. So there, there are things, once we're not such a new chapter that we want to do that we need some significant money for, but uh, that's when we need your ideas. What do you want us to do with these things? So that's why I want to be transparent that we have some money throw us ideas to as to how to spend them and uh, we will go from there. 
if there are no other questions um, or nobody has anything else to share, just let me know uh, of your interests for the things that we have coming up and uh, we will see everybody next month. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Are there, pe are there people who talk about fundraising ideas? Um, so I mean, will. do you mean other chapters or other people? Or just for this chapter, or I don't know if, you know, we can get ideas from other chapters as well, but just some things that popped in my head were the t-shirts Jesse talked about with the grow weed, you yeah. know, with the milk weed, like maybe we could reach out to that t-shirt company and that could be a, a little fun rate. We sell the shirts, we get a, they give us a certain percentage perhaps, or, you know, Kimberton Whole Foods will have those round in dollar uh, days or, or weeks or months for particular organizations, especially nonprofits. I mean, if they do it for non-native honeybee beekeeping clubs, um, I would imagine they would love to do that for, you know, native plant clubs, which is more beneficial to the environment. Yeah. I, I think that those are, all good ideas that we can pursue once we have some goals of how we want to spend the money. I don't, I think as we're starting, we want to focus our efforts on getting the projects and then fundraising for future projects instead of hoarding a bunch of money to then do projects. Um, because I think we all have just a a limited amount of time to work with and it's important to get the a, a few projects under our belt and then fundraise for future money for more projects oh but jesse if there is a member who is good at fundraising and knows how to do it that would be great too you know, basically if a member is interested we'd love to hear about it so if, if that's something that a member wants to take forward, um, great, Let, let's talk about what their ideas are and if we can actually implement them. I mean, those were good ideas that you were just talking about, um, but it's not something that the board can take on on top of everything else we're doing, but we would love for a member to, to be the, the fundraising coordinator and do that. That's really what the organization needs to do right now is branch out beyond the board who are basically the doers and have the next level of doers and idea people taking all of these things further than the five of us can take them because we're pretty tapped with the responsibilities that we have. And that's what committees and project chairs are for. And that is exactly what we need. That is definitely the next step. That's, that's exactly what I meant to say. I take yep. some <laughs> One thought. All right, guys. Okay, so I'm, I'm just getting the meeting notes ready. I'll send them to you, Jesse. Um, that was a great presentation. Thanks for inviting Dan. He was Dan fantastic. Was amazing. I love him. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Um, it was great seeing you all. Take care. I will see you next month. Okay. Good night. Bye bye. He's the Ray Donovan of Invasive Plant Murder. I'd never thought of that until you said it, but. <laughs> It's funny. What's the actor's name? Um, Liv Shriver. Yes, that's it. Yep. Yeah, I, watching him talk, I'm like, man, Ray the Boss Ross is uh, mellowed out. <laughs> that's funny. All right, I'm going to end this. Good night. Good night, guys. I left the doctor's leave like half hour. I'm still trying to leave. Leave meeting.